Are cryptocurrencies the Dutch tulips of the 21st century? Hi, I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet, and joining me is Alexander Lipton. He is the CEO of Stronghold Labs, Connection Science Fellow at MIT, and his article, Beyond Bitcoin, was recently published in Scientific American. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you for having me. What do you do at Stronghold Labs? Well, Stronghold Labs is a startup uh, where we are building uh, novel um, infrastructure and uh, um, for, 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 for banks in the 21st century, more suitable to the current environment. So, yeah. You're, I would say, an expert on not just uh, digital currency, uh, cryptocurrency, but just the banking system of the world uh, in general, not just here in the United States, but abroad. And the evolution that needs to happen in banking, you've written quite a bit about. Let's start with, you know, what is cryptocurrency? Well, a cryptocurrency, the way it exists now, it's an agreement between, uh, um, you know, between willing parties um, of uh, how to calculate the amount of cryptocurrency each particular participant in the system actually has. So as long as you can do it in a consistent, logical way, uh, any group of people can uh, create their own cryptocurrency if they wish to, right? So that's, that's what it is, right? So it's not backed by any government. It's not backed by any fiat currencies. It exists solely as long as there is an agreement uh, between participants of uh, who owns what. That's what it is. We've heard commonly of Bitcoin. That seems to be the most referred to of cryptocurrencies. What are the other cryptocurrencies? Well, there are actually quite a plenty, right? As uh, you know, you can observe there are kind of way in excess of a thousand cryptocurrencies which appeared and some of them already disappeared since Bitcoin was first introduced in the, um, you know, 2009, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, for, for example, there is Ether, which, uh, which is uh, kind of, which um, backs uh, Ethereum, uh, mm, blockchain uh, there is ripple which is behind the uh, ripple blockchain and there are many many other the litecoin for example which is a variation of classical bitcoin there is bitcoin cash etc etc so there are many and some would argue way too many cryptocurrencies in existence right now. well then what are the pros and cons of maybe bitcoin or some other type of cryptocurrency i mean is there a type of crypto that we should be following or should be more interested in? Uh, well, in my opinion, Bitcoin is an important and impressive technical accomplishment. But from a pure financial standpoint, it doesn't really meet the requirements and stated objectives, right? So it's uh, neither decentralized uh, nor transaction cost free and uh, it's extremely volatile as far as its price is concerned and hence it's not really suitable for transactional purposes and so I would say what we really would like to look at are um, electronic um, currencies which are oriented towards uh, facilitating legitimate commerce on the internet. These currencies as such are not yet there but uh, there are concerted efforts by many people to do something along these lines. So one of those is a utility settlement coin, which is being developed by a company called Clearmatics in London, of which I'm a senior scientific advisor. And that currency is linked uh, directly uh, to the fiat currency. Uh, there is a d digital trade coin, which my colleagues at MIT and myself are trying to build uh, and it is backed by assets and at any rate what I'm tr what we should be looking for are currencies uh, which basically can be used in order to meet uh, all the requirements uh, which people normally expect from money in particular to be a store of value a unit of ac account and a means of transaction and so existing cryptocurrencies are not quite there yet what do we need to do or what needs to be done to make cryptocurrency in, you know, 
legitimate for real world finance? In my mind, uh, several um, several uh, obstacles have to be overcome. So one is they have to be made uh, much less volatile than they currently are. And uh, think about it, right? So basically, if you bought uh, Bitcoin for $1,000, you're very happy when it went to $20,000. But if you bought it for $20,000, you're much less happy when it's now kind of $11,000. And so, so see, and it all happened in a very short period of time. And hence, you know, if you are a merchant and try to accept payments in Bitcoin, you open yourself to incredible, you know, fluctuation of value and, you know, uh, risk of ruin. So that's, that's one aspect. So the other aspect is that uh, we need to sort out uh, issues related to um, anti-money laundering uh, laws uh, of the land. And this is quite important as well. So I would say stability is very important and so price stability and then, you know, kind of anti-money laundering is also good. What type of transactions or um, exchange is best for cryptocurrency right now? Well, that is a little hard for me to say uh, because, you know, all of those exchanges have their pros and cons. Uh, and without naming any particular exchange, I would say that the one which has the best uh, um, protections against uh, cyber fraud and cyber attacks is probably a better one. Having said that, you have to understand that the moment you start to trade distributed currency on exchange, the advantages of this currency being distributed actually disappear, right? So it's, you know, theoretically possible to have your own a public key and hold your own Bitcoins and so on and so forth, but that's basically a venue open for people who have very clear understanding of coding and things of that nature, while vast majority of people who speculate in this currency simply open an account with uh, with an exchange, and from that perspective, all this decentralization is lost altogether. You mentioned stability of crypto, or, or rather the instability of cryptocurrency. On what kind of um, platform should crypto be backed in order to maintain stability? Should it be something like gold? Well, that is a possibility, definitely. So basically, my understanding of the situation is as follows. So say Bitcoin, to, to use it as an example, right? Bitcoin has zero value, and as such, it can have any price. You know, things which really, you know, cannot be valued can fluctuate in price uh, very actively. So basically, um, for instance, if you have a car and say it's a Ford and you say it's worth $20,000 and then, you know, you cannot say that it's worth $200,000 because then you will buy a Chevrolet for two hundred dollars for $20,000, etc., etc. With, with Bitcoin, there is no mechanism of that nature and hence price is solely a function of supply and demand and uh, speculative activity of the people who are engaged in this trade. And, ha and so by itself, it cannot be stabilized as such. Besides, think about it. As I was mentioning in the beginning, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, sort of uh, functions of a social construct, which enforced by cryptographic means. And hence, you know, in Bitcoin, all what happens is, is that I send you a Bitcoin, you send a Bitcoin to somebody else, etc., etc., etc. There is no counterflow of anything which is within the system itself. And hence, you really don't know how to solve the delivery versus payment problem, which is all, all important for, for finance. And hence, um, as you say, anchoring this uh, cryptocurrencies and real assets, if it is technically possible, is very attractive. And that's what we try to do with our uh, digital trade coin and uh, other people as well. So as long as uh, you can solve this issue, uh, you will get something which is significantly more stable than uh, what we have right now. Having said that, it will never be completely stable because, say, the price of gold is not stable with respect to the price of the dollar, but that does not prevent it in theory to be used as a medium of exchange because as long as fluctuations are slow compared to the time scales involved in actual trading, it's acceptable. You talk about the digital or the transformation of our banking system, specifically maybe the central banks. What role do the central banks play today and where should potentially they be headed? 
It's a very interesting question right now. So first of all, I want to emphasize that there is a conventional um, wisdom uh, that uh, central banks actually create uh, currency and fiat currency. This is actually not true, at least, you know, as far as I can see. So basically currency in the system is predominantly generated by commercial banks as part of their lending operations. Every time a bank lends money, it creates new money. Whenever money is repaid, it's actually destroyed by the interest stays in the system for good. And so basically the monetary creation is actually delegated by the states to private banks. However, there is an other side of the bargain. In order to be able to create money out of thin air, as commercial banks do, they have to agree to be heavily regulated by the state and by central banks. And that's what they basically do. They regulate the, uh, the activities of uh, a private uh, commercial banking system uh, through several powerful mechanisms. Some are, you know, interest which they charge to their own money uh, which they lend to, to banks and so on and so forth and so basically uh the role of central banks right now is to regulate uh, commercial banks in principle if they want wanted to play kind of truly revolutionary role and change the way uh financial system operates they could do something along the lines of issuing um uh, central bank digital currency that is a very interesting possibility even though the actual and replacing not only physical cash but some other um, assets with this type of currency so right now the actual amount of physical cash is not particularly large it's maybe in the United States about one trillion dollar worth of paper money and everything else is maybe another 20 trillion or so but in principle central banks can issue digital uh, uh, digital currency and uh, then basically move the whole banking industry into direction of becoming much more narrow so banks would actually only hold assets in central bank cash equal to the liabilities in the form of deposits and then lending would be performed by other institutions so that is theoretically possible but I think it's polit politically extremely uh, challenging and it's not also clear that it is really badly needed because right now the system operates reasonably well even though it was not so during the global financial crisis system was quite uh, quite uh, challenged on many fronts uh, I would uh, think that uh, coexistence of narrow banks and the conventional fractional reserve banks would be a very nice outcome and central banks should be pushing in this direction in my mind. It's pretty much like having gasoline cars and electric cars coexisting. I think it's too radical to say all cars have to be electric, but you should be able to have a chance to put your money in a narrow bank if you feel like so, which is not existing right now. Well, and it sounds like we're not really ready for a complete digital transformation. In fact, I my question to you might be even what kind of implication on individual freedom would it, would would there be if we went to eliminating cash completely? Exactly, this is a very deep and interesting question and uh, there are so, answers can be given at several levels. Uh, so certainly individual freedom uh, kind of would be indeed, uh, you know, kind of at risk if indeed uh, all the transactions would be meticulously recorded, etc., etc. Whilst right now cash gives uh, people a modicum of anonymity. And so the question to answer is, uh, you know, you have to structure this digital cash in a way which would potentially emulate some of the features of uh, physical cash. So the, um, the, goal, the, the sweet spot between uh, efficiency of electronic uh, currency and the uh, preservation of uh, individual freedoms uh, has not been found yet. Yeah, it, it is a complicated philosophical slash legal slash technical question. And, you know, people are thinking about it, myself included, but there is no definite answer. Final answer is not there. Well, then what, I, what might be more immediate is what kind of maybe big developments do you expect in the way of cryptocurrency in the coming months? 
Well, it's uh, hard for me to say, but I, I think maybe these markets would become uh, uh, would become uh, more rational. In my mind, uh, we're in the grip of uh, money of sorts, and uh, I think that the stabilization of these markets at a certain level, which is kind of palatable to you know. To, to to people would actually not be such a such a bad idea uh, so in essence if you think about it uh, basically say tulip money jumps to mind but uh, in the following sense i want to emphasize <laughs> that uh, tulip money not only had the you know immediate bad consequence for the parties involved even though it seems like these consequence were severely limited because the actual cash never changed hands uh, in the in holland in the Netherlands during this money. But the interesting thing is that uh, the actual skills of growing tulips grew enormously during this time. And until this day, the Netherlands are the biggest and the most profitable producers of tulips in the world. So if you ever go to the Schiphol Airport, right next to it, there is a huge auction where they sell every day uh, tulips in the so-called uh, uh, Dutch auction from, with the price going from top to bottom. And it's a fantastic view, kind of fun, fantastic spectacle. And as I said, you know, even though there were massive excesses and some people lost money, but as I said, not that many, uh, the actual consequences long term were quite beneficial. And so I hope that this manic study, a system, manic stage of, of this development of cryptocurrencies will be behind us soon enough, and then we will start to reap benefits as a society and as people. Thank you so much, Alexander, for your time. I could talk to you about this topic forever uh, because there's so much to say and I'm really excited to see where we're taking this in the future. If somebody wants more advice from you or to find out what you're doing, how can they go about following you? Uh, well, as you mentioned, you know, we published with some colleagues from MIT a uh, popular article on Scientific American, which is obviously readily available. And I published a few more uh, in some more sort of more specialized journals, but also you can uh, um, follow my activity on uh, LinkedIn. That's the only <laughs> um, social media I have any kind of profile at all. All right. Absolutely. And thank you again. And you can follow me in more of my interviews here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or find me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio or find me on Facebook by searching for The Tanya Hall Show. Till next time. <laughs>